So as usual, we'll start off with introductions. My name is Shelley Shassi Jandro, for those of you who may not know, and I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Monique Sullivan, and I am the ARP coordinator. I'm Karen Kuziak. I coordinated It Cares um, and Carissa and also do some other special projects within our, our uh, office. And I have a sketchy connect connection today. So I may already have gone in and out of Zoom. Good morning, I'm Kevin Harrington and I'm the Gear and Eans Coordinator. Good morning, my name is Mai Shasha and I'm the Fiscal Coordinator. Good morning, I'm Deanna Roberge. I am a Management Analyst. Good morning, I'm Terry Beal, and I'm a contracted invoice reviewer. And like usual, this office hour is being recorded. We do post those on our website. Um, we try to get them in within about a week and a day of, of the material being presented. So if you happen to have missed an item or would like to engage with a topic and you know that it was discussed at our office hour, we do have the recordings as well as the slides on our website. So just a few things that we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna revisit the mandatory learning loss reservation. We're also gonna discuss Davis-Bacon prevailing wages and the requirements associated with that federal regulation. We'll highlight some supplies and equipment reminders. We're going to discuss the updated procedures for the ARP invoice overages. We will also dive into some information about the disposition of federally funded purchases. And we'll, we'll introduce the FY22 ESER performance report and the preparation and what you folks might want to get started while it's being developed within GEMS. And of course, our objective is just to be sure that everyone participating in the ESER funds has the information to be sure that they're using the funds effectively and in alignment with the federal regulations. So this isn't anything new. Uh, that's just a friendly reminder that LEAs are required to address the impact of lost instructional time with at least 20% of their ARP ESRA funds. And um, we just gave an example here that there is a minimum of 20% um, and we do encourage districts to try to do more than 20%. And part of that is because what we're finding now, we knew this when we, when we first started, but we also are finding it now when we're looking at invoicing, the invoicing system, and when some of the remaining fund projects are over budgeted, which we're gonna talk about um, later in this presentation about ARP over expenses, uh, or, or what we call overages, uh, and that you don't want to be over in your remaining funds if you don't have any, if you don't have a window or a cushion in your 20% uh, because you could be out of compliance. And so that is, it is something to think about. And the U.S. Department of Education is monitoring this. They are going to be really monitoring it next year in the FY23 performance report. So it's just something to think about at this point in time. Let's go on to the next slide. So again, here's a, just some a few reminders. Um, again, LEAs are required to address the impact of lost instructional time with at least 20% of their ARP ESSER funds. So again, if your remaining funds projects are starting to go over, you're gonna have to make adjustments to some of your other remaining funds projects if you don't have uh, enough cushion in your 20% to, to take any, to, to account for any of those overages. These are some things that we are finding and they it may cause your application or an invoice to get kicked back. Um, Cross-checking your project descriptions with actual reimbursed expenses. Um, for example, we have summer programming, uh, project states that it will be funding for FY21, 22, and 23. But we're finding that, and then this is, this is a part of the internal controls that we're finding that districts are saying they're going to do something but then when we go back and start doing some checking, uh, they're like for this one, but zero funds have been invoiced for, or reimbursed for FY21 and 22. And with the upcoming performance report, we have to report out on expenses for FY22. And if you said in your performance and you said in your project, 
that you were going to be using this money for summer programming, but you have yet to invoice for it, then that's going to kind of give a skewed picture of what money is being spent for the 20%. It's also gonna look like you haven't, or that a district hasn't spent their 20% as well. So these kind of things that are the inconsistencies that I might look at when I'm reviewing a resubmitted application or um, just something to think about. Also project description says funding for one year, but the project budget includes three years or vice versa. So the budget, the narrative might say three years and then the project description says one year. So it might get reopened um, when, when a project is resubmitted. I know also, I don't have it on the slide, but I know there's some concern with when uh, an application is resubmitted and there's questions about, well, it was, it was approved before. Well, it's, I think in full transparency, I've told quite a few districts when I've had conversations with them, we're in the middle of an internal audit and we're also preparing for um, a for a federal um, monitoring visit uh, back in May, that's coming up in May. And so we're tightening some of our internal controls uh, to make sure that one, we are not out of compliance at the SCA level and we're also not out of compliance with at the SAU level. So a lot of these uh, protocols and a lot of these regulations were already in place, but with the state of emergency we were in with the pandemic, um, some of them were not, um, they were kind of, we just got to get that money out there. So that's something to think about if things get pushed back to you and you're like confused or not understanding why part of this is part of the background for why that's happening. Um, another thing is the minimum amount uh, budgeted for 20% reservation, but one or more of your remaining funds uh, projects are overexpended in uh, the federal, federal grant reimbursement system. I've already mentioned this several times, but your project will be, a project in the application will be reopened to align the project budget with the overexpense and invoicing system. This goes also back to, we're trying to align our approval process, our application review, and also our federal our invoicing system. We're trying to align it back to the federal, uh, the uniform grant guidance requirements, which says that applications have to be pre-approved. And so if you're spending money that wasn't a pre-approved, then we're, that's a violation of, of, of uniform grant guidance. So we're trying to get trying to streamline that and get that back to align with uh, the federal, the um, uniform grant guidance. Invoices may be reopened if, negative, um, if negatives appear in the project total amounts. Now we're gonna talk about this in, an, in a, um, another slide more in depth about what this actually looks like, but I just wanted to give you a heads up if things get, if your applications get reopened when you've resubmitted them or if invoices get kicked back, this part might be part of the reason. Uh, we also, this is in bold, there needs to be a clear connection to COVID-19. Um, we're finding, and it has to also be um, necessary and reasonable, and it needs to be aligned with your meaningful stakeholder consultation. I know I've repeated myself several times over the last few webinars, but there's been a lot of reopenings of, app, of ARPS or three applications, and all these things still need to be in place when you're doing that. Um, and especially, I'll tell you, if you're reopening a lot of your projects, the, it's, the level of uh, review may not be the same as it was when it was first, when we first started doing these reviews. And again, the US Department of Education is still checking on district URLs to make sure the use of, the use of plans and the safe return to in-person instruction plans are publicly available on a district's website and that the safe return to in-person um, instruction plan has been reviewed in the last six months. So these are things, just uh, friendly reminders um, so that you won't be shocked if things get kicked back or you have some questions. And one thing that you folks want to keep in mind that we're also bringing to the forefront through these two last slides is that 20% is statutorily required. So at the end of ARP, if you are funds are being returned or have been unused and will not be drawn down or requested in a reimbursement, you want to be sure that you've considered the attempts that you've made to focus on that learning loss, which is in the statutory requirements. So again, it may not come to the end of ARP in September of September 30th of 2024. And 
you're just returning 20% of your funds because you didn't may not have been able to uh, have any impact on the loss of in instructional time. So really thinking about what that means, that term that says you must utilize 20% of your ARP ESER funds. So if you are spending 60% of your funds, thinking about potentially how much of that 60% can be focused on learning loss instruction. In the application, it does have a logic that indicates that you've met the minimum and budgeted for it, but how does that transpire into the actuals and the reimbursements that you're requesting? So here's a few supplies and equipment reminders. Um, internal state auditors are looking for clear connections to the COVID to COVID for supplies and equipment purchased with your ESSER funds. Um, examples, furniture, desks, chairs, um, PE equipment, boilers, roofs, snow plows, vehicles, and outdoor structures. Inventory requirements, it's the responsibility of the SAU to have a procedure identified for tracking and inventorying property purchased. The procedure must meet the following federal requirements. And here is your two links that you are able to go to to be able to verify that. So as a district, you, you likely have an inventory requirement because this is not the first time you're purchasing supplies or equipment with federal funds, but being sure that you're updating that inventory requirement list to be sure that it's including everything that's been purchased with ESER funds that fall into that category and tagging it appropriately. Hi, this is Karen. I don't have the video on um, in hopes that I won't get bumped. Uh, but we want to remind folks about Davis-Bacon Act and the prevailing wages requirement of uh, for projects for some projects that are funded with. Um, ESSER or GEAR funds. An LEA that uses ESSER or GEAR funds for the following, minor remodeling, renovation, repair, or construction contracts over $2,000 must meet all Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements. That's a US Ed federal fund requirement. Some HVAC upgrades may constitute minor remodeling. Minor remodeling means minor alterations in a previously completed building. And some, a, a lot of SAUs have that, those kinds of projects going on. The term also includes the extension of utility lines such as water and electricity from points beyond the confines, confines of the space in which the minor remodeling is undertaken, but within the confines of the previously completed building. And that's directly from the uh, FAQ document that was updated in December B7. And for, and it's really the SAU or LEA's responsibility to follow the Davis-Bacon requirements. And we've listed here a number of resources um, that the US Department of Labor has put together. Um, so that you can find the fact sheets, you can find the poster that you have to uh, have on the site. Uh, you can find what you need to do for record keeping and for you know being able to prove that the payrolls were uh, in line with the requirements and also a, a place to find the wage determinations uh, for where we are for Maine. And here are the rules for the prevailing wage requirement. These are from Maine statute. An SAU must obtain from the Department of Labor a schedule of prevailing wages and benefits. The SAU must include the schedule in the bid documents. So all the uh, folks who are bidding will know that what the requirements are. The contractor con contractor's contract must include a provision that the contractor and all subcontractors will pay the state prevailing wages and benefits. The contractor and subcontractors must post a statement of the prevailing wages and benefits at the job site. The contractor and subcontractors must keep records as required by uh, Maine statute. 
And the contractor and subcontractors must require that craft workers have completed 10 hours of construction safety training. And please note the asterisk for projects that are funded in whole or part by federal funds and subject to the Davis-Bacon Act, the state prevailing wage and benefits do not apply. It's the Davis-Bacon wages that apply. And here's a reminder about HVAC. If an LEA uses funds for HVAC system under this is federal uh, statute now, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, I'm going to guess that says ASHRAE. I don't live in their world, but let's say ASHRAE standards apply. Please note that for the purpose of HVAC projects supported by the U.S. Department of Education COVID relief funds, the department has indicated that projects must meet or should meet the current ASHRAE standards. And again, that's from the um, updated FAQ B7. And uh, so we have a, if you want to look at those FAQs yourselves, we have a link to it. Um, they included expanded descriptions of considerations regarding construction projects funded by ESSER. Our team is continuing to schedule meetings to discuss the status of projects. Um, we, we typically do one a week. Um, and I, I will be the one that will contact you about that, contact districts about that. And you can, there's my, there's my contact information if you have questions or want to meet earlier or, or want some uh, advice about how what to do uh, if you run into some questions related to your construction project that's funded by ESSER. And we highlighted all of this information because we see the trend that is happening within the US Department of Education and the questions that they're posing to state education agencies. And as a subrecipient, we want to be sure that you folks have a clear understanding of all of the requirements I know that in the heat of the moment in May of 21 or even December of 21, we were all working diligently to get kiddos back into schools and trying to do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And now we need just to be sure that we are aware of the requirements, we're following the requirements, and in, in any cases that we have the documentation to show that those requirements are being followed now that things have I won't say slow down, but have come to uh, more of a resemblance of what was normal prior to the pandemic. We just want to be sure that we are not jeopardizing or compromising any funds and putting our districts in a position where they do not necessarily have the documentation or are trying to recreate things in the heat of the moment. So as Monique mentioned, we are continuously working to improve our processes to make sure we are minimizing as much, uh, minimizing all those audit findings as much as possible. And we are tightening our internal controls and protocols. And at, as a part of that, we initiated uh, a process, new process change in 10% overage and which was effective from February 2nd, 2023. So as per the new process, as we mentioned last uh, month as well, expenses for ARP invoices cannot be submitted in a budget category that does not have an associated application budget. An invoice can overexpend in a bad project budget category between object codes if the overage does not exceed 10 exceed 10% of the project application budget and and on the top of that we need to make sure the total project amount reimbursed is not negative and the, this um, this change was made to make sure we are spending 20% uh, our 20% budget for reservation 
projects uh, because that's a statutory statute, uh, statutory requirement for our ARP uh, uh, grant. And invoices and application will be reopened if a negative um, amount is found under any to, uh, project budget uh, because to uh, uh, to to be uh, you know to be go with this process change we will going forward we will reopen any invoice if we find there is any negative budget under any project uh, total project budget so what it, how it looks like there is a two example to show you in the first example you can see that under this project, the total project budget is $1,181.92. Under salary and benefits, it is over expense by $118. And in the total budget amount, if, if you see there, it is also over by $118, which is not allowed, even though this amount is within 10%, of this project, but it cannot over the total budget. But in this example one, it is it um, the hundred and eighteen dollar. It resulted in addition, you know, a negative amount under this project. So that's why it won't be allowed. And if we find such scenario when we are reviewing our invoice, it will be reopened. And in the second example. You can see uh, there is a over expense of $99.76 under salary and benefit. But if when we are calculating this overage by total project budget, it is within 10% and the total budget amount is still positive. So we will allow that 10% overage. Or, or, or uh, like uh, this overage. So if you calculate $99.76, it is about 5% of the total project budget. And it is, it is um, you know, it resulted in a positive budget, project budget. So it is allowable and we will, um, you know, when we are reviewing it, we will approve this one. And we're not saying that the first example is an unallowable expense. We're just indicating that it no longer aligns to your application, which potentially is compromising your 20% reservation funds. And we wanna be sure that your application and your invoice requests are aligned to the best of its ability. So for example, number one, we would go back to the applicant coordinator and to the business manager and indicate that there's an overage and we would reopen accordingly, as Maisha said. It's not an indication that this is not an allowable expense, just we need to be sure that we're aligning to the approved application. So this is an item and a slide that you folks, if you have attended multiple office hours, um, has have seen before. So the disposition of fairly funded purchase. So there's three large categories, supplies, equipment, and real property. And it's really important to identify the way in which you have denoted the tangible item that has been purchased so that you can highlight the next steps in this process. And I won't read the slide specifically, but one of the things that we want to call your attention to is when we're dealing with supplies in particular. So a supply is less, and, and one individual item that is less than $5,000. If you have an aggregate total of unused, which doesn't necessarily mean still brand new, but is an item that you no longer are using for the allowable use that it was approved in or another federal allowable use or an activity under any US Department of Ed funding. If there's an aggregate total of, more, of less than $5,000, it would be classified as a supply. But the fair market value, which is on this next slide, is really important. 
So when you're determining the fair market value, when you're talking about equipment, that would be potentially one item. When you're talking about supplies, it's the total aggregate. So we wanted to highlight that information in an example. And this is an example that you have seen uh, a fair amount of times. I think we this is probably our third month discussing disposition of federally funded funds, um, federally funded purchases. But essentially we wanna call your attention to the right hand column of these slides and indicate that those Mac Apple books are all under supplies because their unit price was less than $5,000 when purchased. However, again, we're talking about that aggregate total of unused items. So it's not per unit when it comes to supplies, it's that aggregate total. So you'll see here, our example has been updated accordingly with that understanding and our conversations with the US Department of Ed. So if an a unused computer is $969 at a fair market value, and you have six of them that are identical, the same exact item that you coded under supplies, your aggregate total of unused supplies is now over $5,000. And that's when that $5,000 threshold kicks in, again, when you're talking about retaining, selling, or disposing of items that were purchased with federal funds. So again, uh, the last bullet has been updated accordingly with our conversation with the US Department of Ed. And those computers as a whole, those six identical uh, computers that were coded under supplies could either be retained or sold. And if they were to be sold, then $500 or 10%, whichever is less, would be maintained by the district. And all of the proceeds uh, minus that 500 or 10% would be returned to the US Department of Ed. And to boil this all down, the federal funds are not a revenue generating item. So if you are making a profit on a sale, that profit is returned to the US Department of Ed and you would maintain $500 or 10% less for the sale of that item. So keeping that in mind, uh, and again, we've updated our slides accordingly. We also have a handout that we've been sharing with districts and that has been updated accordingly. So essentially keeping this $5,000 market value is the key when you're when you're having conversations. Is it under or over? And in regards to equipment, it's per unit. And in regards to supplies, it's aggregate. So we highlighted um, on our topic slide that we would discuss the performance reports. So the SEA, so the Maine Department of Education's annual performance report is due May 4th. And that date was released about two and a half weeks ago. What we've been doing in the interim is pulling together and attending webinars to identify what we would need to collect from our SAUs to be able to be sure that we're, we're reporting to the US Department of Education. So the ES, F, which is the Education Stabilization Fund, which includes all of the ESER funds. So CARE ESER 1, CARISA ESER 2, ARP ESER 3. There is a public data collection form and that public collection data form is available online. It's 59 pages or so. And that's what the US Department of Education is asking of all of the SEAs in the nation so that they can collect information and report back to all of the items that they report back on. So the reporting timeline for our SAUs as well as the SEA is July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022. So fiscal year 2022. Something to keep in mind is you may have had an expense in that time frame, but it wasn't a reimbursement request in that time frame. And our performance report is going to focus on the expenses that were reimbursed in that fiscal year of 2021. So we have determined that we, to be able to report to the US Department of Ed, 
have generated an SAU annual performance report, which we refer to as the ESER performance report for FY22, and that will be due on April 7th of 2023. We completely understand that is, that is an extremely tight turnaround time. So we are putting a blank template copy of the performance report on our website while the report is being built in GEMS. We are hopeful that the report will be um, in a test form by the end of this week and be able to be live early midweek next week. But in the meantime, we, we are putting together a priority notice that will go out to districts with the link to the website, to the blank template, as well as we will also be sending out an email via GEMS. One of the notions that I wanna draw your attention to, and I, I alluded to it earlier in the reporting timeline, what our team is doing is we are pulling together all of the reimbursement requests that were made in FY22 and in the performance report, it will highlight the number of dollars that were drawn down or requested in that time frame, so that you are always tying back to that dollar value. So you can make the connection between the expense may have happened on um, June 17th, but I only requested it in July 15th of 2022, which means it's out of the reporting timeline. So we're hoping that fiscal data will help to streamline the process, but also provide a support to our districts as we are well aware that it is a very tight turnaround time. And again, um, Monique highlighted it in earlier slides. The performance report will also request active links to the use of funds plan and to the safe return to in-person plan. And just a friendly reminder, these plans are required to be reviewed and updated if applicable every six months. So in the performance report, we're going to ask you for the URL um, for both of those plans, each of those plans. And then we will also ask you if it's been reviewed and the date that it's been reviewed and revised and the date that it's been revised. And that should correlate with the information that is publicly available on the website. And we will work on posting the link in the chat box. And if we don't get to it uh, by close of the hour today, we will be sure that it's sent to you folks in the priority notice. As always, we leave you with some resources. We also highlight our office hours for the first Thursday of every month, but you folks are here. So you're well aware of those monthly office hours. We do encourage you to share this registration link with your business managers, or potentially if your curriculum director is not the ESER applicant coordinator, you can also share with central office staff. We essentially welcome all to these office hours because we do feel that this information is important for our ESER applicant coordinators, but also funnels into a whole array of roles. And you'll, you'll see that on the performance report that there potentially will be some questions that you have to work with colleagues at the central office or um, within uh, each individual school units that you have. So keep that in mind when you're you know, promoting the registration of this office hour for us. We also put out a monthly newsletter. So we do have our monthly newsletters all the way through February of 2023 posted on our website. If you happen to have missed one, they are only two pages. They have some real highlighted information that we wanna be sure everyone is aware of. We do encourage you to view those. And here is our contact information. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna leave that up on the computer screen for just a moment. And then I'm going to take away the screen so that we can see our faces and engage in question and answers. I know that there was one question that we've tended to right in the chat box. So if you were looking for that link for the um, template of the performance report, you can find that in the chat box. Then we'll open it up to any questions. I have a question, uh, Shelley, um, and that is that uh, it seems as though the next 
scheduled office hour is a day before um, this is due. And I'm just wondering if it would be a, a good idea for the department, uh, just having released a template um, to have another meeting prior to that next scheduled meeting, as I anticipate there may be some folks that have some questions before the day that it's due. So that's a great question, and I apologize that I don't have the information, it was not posted on our slides, but essentially we have a, an office hour uh, dedicated to the performance report on 314, which is a Tuesday. I believe it's at one o'clock, but I would love just a confirmation from one of the teammates as they open up their calendar, because as you can imagine, when you're you know, in a Zoom meeting, it's difficult to have multiple windows open. But we can be sure to post that registration link. And then also, the other thing we're doing, very similar to last year when we released the performance report, in addition to the specific office hour associated with the performance report, we are also hosting one hour walk-in uh, office hours on Wednesday. So between Wednesday the 15th of March through April 5th, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, you can join us. It's going to be a no agenda, one hour. Our team will be, a few members of our team will be there to answer any questions that you folks have in regards to the performance report. Thank you. I had, excuse me, I had a question regarding uh, disposing of equipment. If something is deemed to be non-usable or have a really reduced value, does that change and how do we document it? I'm thinking, for example, let's say we purchased Chromebooks for students and they get to the point where they're really outdated and we're not able to use them. So the Chromebooks are going to likely sit in the supply category because it doesn't meet that $5,000 federal threshold for it to go to equipment. At a local level, you may choose to code it as equipment, but essentially at a federal level, that threshold for equipment is $5,000. And $5,000 is used a lot in multiple different contexts. So um, when we are identifying if it is a supplier equipment, we indicate, was that unit price $5,000 or more uh, at time of purchase? So those Chromebooks, I believe, probably were not $5,000 or more per unit. So they're a supply. Okay, I, I think the example of the MacBooks and having six of them exceeding the $5,000 made me question that. Just because if we have $10,000 worth of Chromebooks, would that then be considered equipment and not a set like it it goes over that five thousand? No, it's different. So it it initiates supplies, right? It was initiated and purchased as a supply. And what happens is when you're going to dispose of them, retain, sell, or, or dispose of them, you have to determine aggregately how much they are the fair market value is for those 10. Chromebooks or that $10,000 original purchase of Chromebooks. Okay. Um, so it triggers, it still stays as a supply and that supply triggers to be aggregate versus unit costs. So Chromebooks potentially are at a place where multiple years later are no longer being updated or uh, software cannot be uh, put onto these devices. And what happens is they can either be retained or sold if they exceed the $5,000 market aggregate total. Okay, thank you. The Wednesday, sorry, I, I spotted a question in the chat box. Thank you, Karen. The Wednesday open no agenda office hours for the performance report take place at 11. So between 11 and 12, you can pop in anytime 
if you have questions regarding the performance report. You, there will be at least one, if not multiple members of our team available during that one office hour, uh, one hour office hour for the performance report. <laughs>